Well, look at that. We go from one meeting to another. Hi, everybody. Long time no see for a few of you. It's good to have you here. I know you Yahuwah can't make it today, so... Um, today's most important question is what time you eat lunch. Are you pretty consistent on all these? Sean? I'm, I'm not at all. I'm not at all consistent. When I say often, that means that sometimes I don't eat lunch or sometimes I snack at 11 and 3. Uh, you know, it just depends on what I'm doing and where I am. How the day and if I'm hungry, if I'm hungry too, you know. That's true. I feel like the older I get, the less hungry I am. <laughs> I mean, like for food. <clears throat> As opposed to beer and coffee? <laughs> or, or like, you know, my hunger for getting shit done or whatever, you know. <laughs> oh, I see what you're saying. <laughs> yeah, yeah. All right. Okay, well, we have um, just a few things on the agenda today. I thought, um, so I don't know if you saw you. Hui can't make it today. Um, so I think he is going to have some updates on, on Compass. In the next meeting. So if you recall from the last meeting, um, they were deploying the individual chaos metrics in Compass so that we could build the models against those metrics. Do you remember that conversation? Like we actually looked at a spreadsheet that they had and kind of helped prioritize a few of the metrics that were being deployed in Compass. So uh, Yuhui had said that they're working on that, and I think the implementation is expected to be done on those metrics by the end of the month, which is really cool. And then he wanted to give a demo next time we meet on kind of what that's looking like. Um, and what I'm kind of thinking where it's going to go is that in Compass, um, people are going to be able to deploy met these metrics models to the repositories that they care about, assuming that the metrics models contain the metrics that are deployed in Compass. So that's my thought. I, I, we'll see if I'm right or wrong. I don't know. <laughs> but that's kind of what I, I feel like the conversation has been heading. Does anybody else have any thoughts on that? Or... No. Sean, I know things are similar for you, kind of on your end, um, just in terms of deploying metrics and potentially having those displayed in Augur 8 not as metric models. So if you ever want to talk about that here in this group too, that'd be cool. Yeah, no, I think, I, I mean, just to, just to kind of update the group on where that's going, uh, for the last three or four months, we only had Cali on 8 knot so the place we would implement those is 8 knot and when when uh, we get another engineer assigned which they're in the process of doing uh we can pick that back up okay how um how how are you considering things like um like allowing uh, maybe let me back up so would you do you envision like deploying the metrics models and then when somebody logs in those models would be available to point at repositories that they care about yeah like, the, what's the, the, the flow idea there? i mean the flow would be that there'd be a metric model tab on the okay. eight knot app and you'd pick that metric model from that tab and see it and you could of course filter for any repos that are in the instance that you're looking at okay so if you're logged in you're only gonna you'll see the things that you care about in a okay. list yeah and if you're not logged in then you can do the same thing for any repo that's in the database that you can search and what would that database be in this case is it all the things yeah. what uh oh are you talking about the presentation of the models or are you talking about well, like if data? you're not logged in what what data do they have access to people um they have access to any data that's been added by the owner of the instance which is me mm -hmm. so if somebody goes in and adds repos and they're the only ones who have added them they'll only see those when they are logged in i see so okay <clears throat> so it's kind of like a curated list of repos basically by you Yes. Which is okay. Yes. I'm just curious what the yeah. public. Um, the public. The public instance is like that's based. Almost everything is in that. 
anyway. That list. Okay. Yeah, because the things that individuals are interested in mm -hmm. seldom do not overlap with the giant path of projects that are in the public instance right now. Okay. And then <clears throat> the login essentially narrows that list down to the to the views that people want. Is that right? Yeah, that's okay. right. Okay, cool. Well, if you ever want to kind of like what they're doing with Compass, give an update on that, like a visual, that'd be cool. Yeah. Yeah, no, I... I um... I think I, th I think that would be great. Obviously, you know, Compass has a lot more resources, uh, people contributing to it. So um, I'll, I'm very keen. I'm I'm keen to see what they come up with. So okay. <clears throat> All right. Yeah. I, what I what I'm not sure with Compass is whether or not the metrics models themselves will be deployed, or if the metrics will be available to create models however somebody sees fit. Yeah. I'm not sure. That's what I, mean. I don't know either. I don't know either. Yeah. Okay. Um, any other comments on that from folks? All right. Good. Um, so I thought we could maybe spend a little bit of time today, kind of like our metrics meeting after this one, um, taking a look at some metrics models and trying to work some of these into publication <coughs> in a little while <laughs> since we've had some of these uh, hit publication. I think if we could return a couple of these meetings uh, to that, that would be awesome. So we have a couple that we had talked about in the past. Um, and so I had originally brought this one up, Project Decline as um, one that I think is of particular interest and why I think it's of particular interest to folks is um, that you've heard the conversations with uh, SBOM communities that are potentially taking a look at including some health characteristics in say like the Cyclone DX or the SPDX doc. Have you heard that? I think I think a lot of you're familiar with that conversation. Yeah. <clears throat> question is like, yeah, familiar with it. So I think the question is like, what, what would we, what what would we want to show? In that, um, <clears throat> and how would we potentially show that? So, um, assuming that. Like I think the way that most S bombs are produced is they're produced in like kind of in real time as as projects are used inside of an organization. I don't think that a lot of projects actually have S bomb documents in their repository. So if we were going to produce something like this in real time or ask people to produce something like this in real time, like what would we want the S bomb to actually represent as an important component of project health. And project decline was one that had come up regularly. So that an organization might wanna see if, a, if there's a state of, of decline or maybe a state of change in an upstream project. I don't know what you, you all think of that. I confess that I'm only familiar with the an older SPDX standard, and I'm not familiar enough with the current SPDX or Cyclone DX standards to know if they're including, uh, and I expect they would, but if do they include the versions of the dependencies in, I think so. in the yeah. SBOMs? So yeah, that's, <clears throat> I think that's, that and licensing, I think are the two principal values that people derive from the SBOMs with regards to health. Is there something that we could kind of point to that would also be around the community activity? Are you suggesting including something like community activity in an SBOM? Like, yeah, uh, I think that's kind of a conversation, like a little bit more revealing than, say, a, a standard license doc. But trying to reveal a little bit about the upstream community itself. I'm thinking. It's okay. The other I'm curious what I'm curious for Don's perspective. I, I think 
Yeah, I'm a little um <clears throat> I'm a little bit confused about the S bomb discussion just because I haven't been involved in any of those discussions. And I, I must have missed when you were talking about how um how this relates to that. But I'm also just looking at the like the title and the idea behind the metric, mm -hmm. I'm struggling to understand how this is different than some of the viability metrics models that, that Gary has worked on because the point of the viability metrics models is to understand if you've got problematic projects that are problematic for, you know, mm -hmm. a number of reasons that they might become unviable. And it feels like it feels like project decline is maybe a subset or a special case of a project becoming unviable. Okay. And so I'm just not I'm not sure what to do with this one. Okay, that's fine. So it's kind of two parts to your question, I think. So the the first is the, the conversations around this are really early. So I don't know that I have a clear idea either. I'm trying to sort out just what I'm hearing, <laughs> you know, in a few um, in a few spots. And if other people are gay org, I know you've been attending those meetings as well. So if you're hearing something different, please let me know. Um, but the idea is, is, is a lot of what the SBOM currently provides is insight into the packages that are in that particular project, the licenses that are associated with them, and any known vulnerabilities that might be carried forward in those. It's kind of kind of that. And so I think the question is, is can we also like um, look under the hood a little bit at the community that's actually supporting this project? Can we also get a better understanding of that as well? Because if, say, a license is extremely problematic, when you get the SBOM, obviously a company might be like, no, this isn't going to work for us internally. Or if it's packed with vulnerabilities, again, you might be like, nah, not our thing. And I think the argument is the same could hold true for a community. If there's some sort of reflection in that community that is off-putting, <laughs> that you might want to know that. And the SBOM could help carry some of that info forward. So that's what I understand the conversation to be about. And it's not currently in any of the specs. So if we were going to include it, what what, what would we want in there? We do we do have dependency metrics from the root group formerly known as risk. So some of we do have metrics for some things, but they're not incorporated into an SBOM context. And so the question is, how would we I mean, essentially merge these notions of dependencies that we've identified or articulated into to basically say the SBOM is a representation of that. So it might be modifying something that is currently in place. <clears throat> but then how do you represent the SBOM? I don't yeah, know. How do you share that? Georg, do you have thoughts as well? The the project health metrics that we have are evolving as the community evolves, whereas the SBOM is a point in time, here's what it looks like right now. And the thing that would help, and this is from working with customers that are looking at this, they want to be able to calculate these metrics at the time of making a decision the historical information is not as relevant. Okay. So I am that, hesitant. That's on the consumer side, Georg? On the consumer side, yes. So I'm hesitant to include specific metrics. Now, there's another conversation um, about projects wanting to express ways to ask for help. And this was in Emma. Irvin's blog post when Microsoft was looking at how do we support these projects, there's no way right now that con uh, that maintainers express in a standard way, here's the type of help we want. If that moves into the SBOM as a way of saying, here's the software that we are creating, and here are the ways that we most need help right now, then that tells a different story. And then we have, the maintainers might have a more um, 
specific outlook on here's what I'm thinking about. The metrics can help them have a more holistic picture and we could come up with a metric model that makes suggestions on areas in the project that could need some help. The other perspective is maintainers may not do that work. It might be the foundations or the larger community around them that says, hey, this is abandoned or whatever. And so I don't know what the mechanisms would be, but they might be interested in a health assessment to make that determination Hey, this is a project that needs more people or whatever. So those are three different perspectives I have on how the metrics are used and the relationship to the SBOM. I picked up two. I didn't pick up three. So the, the first one, we'll go ahead and run through the list. <laughs> one was the consumer. Yep. One was the maintainer and one was the open source foundation or larger community that the project is part of. Okay. So if they are in a package manager, let's say the package index for Python, the PIP, then maybe the Python foundation would like to create labels for projects based on some chaos metrics. I don't know. I don't know. Deb has not indicated that when I talked with her, but I could imagine a future where that happens. Okay. Um, the, I, I have heard that conversation about external like evaluation of projects. I'm, I'm super hesitant on that one just because, um, I don't know, some, third party that's assigning ascribing value or some sort of judgment against a project always seems a little thorny. Um, There's always been a possibility that people will use chaos metrics or data to do that though. I mean, I think it probably yeah. happens. We're just not sponsoring it, I suppose. Yeah, <laughs> agreed. <laughs> um, do other people have thoughts here? I mean, is this a unsolvable problem in in the SBOM space? I, think, I, I guess I think I'll just keep going to the meetings, I guess. <laughs> I, I, I mean, I, I, I'm kind of turned into this group of experts here to help me through this. <laughs> so I mean, I see I see it as something that people are certainly interested in, and okay. but but I think we don't actually need to define much about it. I, I think this is a case, and this is of course I'm perhaps a bit biased, but I think this is a case where we might um, familiarize ourselves or incorporate the more contemporary tooling uh, for doing these. SBOM scans that the SPDX group and the Cyclone VX groups have developed, and then making that available to people who consume who consume chaos metrics in the same way that we make it available um, <clears throat> through other tools. So um, this, I think, this could be something that uh, Turgia or Augur or Compass um, incorporate into the tooling, but I'm not sure that we need to do much thinking to define anything because I think that SPDX group just thinking LF centric has have done that right so similar to how I have we haven't pursued defining security oriented things for the most part with some small exceptions because OpenSSF has that mm -hmm. but we are using OpenSSF tools in Augur and I think in in Compass as well to provide that data. So, okay. I mean, I think it's the, we kind of become a clearinghouse for these other projects because folks might come to us first and not have the experience to reach out into these other significant LF projects. And again, I'm kind of looking yeah. at Don and Georg to correct me or to redirect that thought because I have one perspective. <laughs> I, I think there's nothing we need to do at this point. Okay. We are the 
experts on what can be done with metrics. And the problem that needs to be solved first is, is one question is, is SBOM the right solution to the problem? And is this going to be accepted by both sides, the consumers that will need to consume the information or might care about it and the maintainers that would care about sending this information out. And right now I'm not convinced the SBOM is the right format. And okay. once that has been determined, then we can enter with how do we support that signaling that is happening here with metrics. Okay. So there needs to be more requirements gathering on the Cyclone DX group, defining the use cases and identifying people on both sides of the equation. Okay, fair. Okay. Don, do you have any thoughts on this now that you're hearing it at all? No, I just, I honestly, like, I, I just don't spend any time thinking about things like S bombs and licensing and Okay. So, so I just, I just feel like I don't have a very informed opinion. It's just not my, it's not very exciting to me. So I tend to ignore it unless I have to. So this is like how to get like whole stuff it. into it. It's how to like, I think the bigger question for me, it's not about S bombs. It's about how to like standardize sharing of this information, the information that we can provide. And S bombs yeah. are like currently a standard that are in place that provide sharing of other information. Mm -hmm between projects, that's all. Yeah, but do do they do they want to bloat that kind of format to put well, other stuff in yeah, it? Yeah, so that, I think Georg brought up a good point because I think he's kind of addressing that. Like, yeah. do, do the producers, the consumers and the maintainers of this even want this in the first place? And then if the answer is no, then this is a moot conversation. You know, like if they do, feel like groundwork that says <laughs> do we do y'all even want this and then i think to sean's point like maybe the better solution is just thinking about how tooling could support this information but not necessarily <laughs> part of the standard yeah because there i mean there are so many upcoming legal things around around s bombs and the requirement of s bombs both in the us and the eu that I suspect that people are going to resist stuffing a bunch of extra stuff into the S bombs um, because it might complicate some yeah. of those those conversations. Sure. Um, but what what might make sense is to use basically use the the same type of format, like so that people who consume S bombs could also consume this data relatively <laughs> easily, maybe with a few additional changes. Okay. So it might be that we that we release it, release some of this information in a, a format that's easily consumable if people are already consuming S bombs. But yeah, I don't know. I mean, yeah, like I said, you kind of have to talk to the S bomb people to see if they'd even be interested in this sort of data. But I'd I'd be concerned that we're loading something that becomes a legal requirement for people. That's fair. I mean, they're already like very heavy docs anyway. Like, <laughs> already a lot to take in. Yeah. Um, Sean, did you have a comment there? Oh, I was I was just saying, I really, as we go deeper here, I really think I need to familiarize myself more with what the tooling that exists over with SPX yeah. currently produces, because it's evolved quite a lot the last two, three years. Okay. And I have not updated my knowledge of where that project is at though I suspect significantly more advanced than the last time I looked. Probably, yeah. I haven't looked in a long time either myself. Yeah. Um, okay, this is, thank you for this conversation. I know it took a half hour, but could you, um, I'm thinking like Georg or Sean or Don, Elizabeth, whoever, Winifred, if you're on these meetings, I think maybe the first thing we push from the chaos side is I really like the idea of gathering a little bit more information. <laughs> we need to understand to your point, Gary, and Don and John, like we need to really understand whether or not this is a feasible thing to even include in an SPOM. And it's not for us to decide whether or not it's feasible. It's for 
the consumers and producers to decide whether or not this is feasible. Um, and only once that question is answered, should we really start thinking about, to your point, Don, maybe a supplemental format that could provide this information or something that could be included in the SBOM. Like, once we realize that there is a need for this in that standardized way, then we could think about what is actually included. That would, um, I think that's really good because that takes some thinking off of my plate. <sighs> when we can have a, a, a consistent message to, to the folks like at Cyclone DX or SPDX that <laughs> we need more info first before we can think about what might actually be in there. Okay, great. Any other comments on this? Thank you. This is a, this is actually a fairly big issue for me. All right. Okay. Um, well, let me, um, Yeah, let me bring up something else here then. Okay, so um, I'll bring up a different metric model here that aside from the SBOM conversation. It's in the minutes, um, I'll put it in the chat too. But this is a metric model focused on just kind of that top issue of trying to retain contributors. And we have a couple different metrics that we were thinking about with respect to how we understand the retention of contributors. And so we have the contributor absence factor and I <laughs> formerly bus factor and um, new contributors and occasional contributors. I think these are the metrics that we have that are kind of associated with contributions. Do people think this is a metric model that is something that we should pull, push forward? Seems to be an ongoing question for a number of people. Give you a second to read it. So the retention of contributors is important. And I think the story here makes a lot of sense that it is, warrants being a metric model. Okay, I agree. The, the, so we have in the metrics, contributor absence factor, which is good to indicate how centralized is the knowledge and activity on few contributors? Yep. We have new contributors, which is the supply of new blood to the project. Uh, occasional contributors is similar to contributor absence factor. It provides information about the, I think of the onion model with core regular and casual contributors. So maybe we can expand that here to think about the onion model and occasional contributors and contribute absence factors being two components of that, or we keep it as separate mm -hmm. metrics, but it, it's a good indicator. What I'm at second contributors, uh, second contributions is a good one that qualifies the occasional contributors the one metric I would add here also is contributors leaving the project so that we have the inflow and outflow or the ratio. Maybe it's growth of active contributors as the combination of contributors leaving and joining. Okay. 
Uh, Don, you brought up this practitioner guide. Yeah, so we do have the practitioner guide with the same name as this potential metric model. So I think we should we should think about we should think about that. I mean, I think it would be good to have a metric model around contributor sustainability. Mm -hmm. um, but I think we should. I think, yeah. I I guess I would need to maybe think more about how we would distinguish it from from the guide, or or make sure that it adds additional stuff in addition to the guide. Okay. Um, we do have. We also call it contributor retention, which could be a different way of thinking about it. I mean, this this question yeah. brings up my my ongoing struggle of the model and <laughs> guide relationship, <laughs> but oh. um, but I feel like um, yeah. contributor retention and contributor sustainability are similar things. Mm -hmm. but I feel like they're very different. I mean, contributor retention is very specifically about retaining the contributors you already have. Mm -hmm. That is one, just one element of contributor sustainability. So if you think about contributor sustainability, that is on the one hand, retaining the contributors that you already have, but also growing mm -hmm. your overall contributor base so that you're adding new contributors who can then sustain the project over the long term as, as contributors do leave because they, they, they will leave. Um, so I would say that those are two different things. Fair. Yeah. I would say contributor retention specifically is a subset of contributor sustainability. It's one but piece. Focus on keeping the people around who are already there. And I mean, I'm I'm fine with having a, a metric model that's focused on contributor sustainability. I just um, we should try to be a little bit consistent with the practitioner guide, but then build on it. So the practitioner guide just has the three metrics. So we should probably make sure that these three metrics are in the model, but I think the model could have a lot more metrics. And if you scroll down a little bit, there's the uh, gather additional data. <clears throat> um, so these are some other things that I was thinking about when it comes to contributor sustainability. So these might also be good candidates for the model. So if we, if we have a, um... You're going to hate me for asking this question, but if we have a practitioner guide <laughs> that, is, <laughs> that is called contributor sustainability, and we have a metric model that is called contributor sustainability, like what, what? That's my question. <laughs> I personally, I personally <laughs> don't see any conflict with having okay. both of them and having them be different. Because okay. I think that the metrics models are one thing and the contributor guides or the practitioner guides are a different thing. Mm -hmm. um, I agree. I, I, I see think, it the same way. Yeah. And I think contributor sustainability is such a big topic. Yeah. I mean, that's that's something that um, all of us working in open source are, are thinking about. So it's uh, so it doesn't surprise me that we would end up with also a, a model okay. in, addition to a, in, in addition to a guide. One I of think the Big oh. topics are that that's just going to happen. Fair, that's just going to happen. I mean, one of the conversations we had a while back, and I actually don't think you were there, Don, was we were kind of talking about this relationship again. And where we kind of landed was that the metric models provide a nice structure for deployment and tooling mm -hmm. for tool developers to think about the deployment of metrics and then those combination of metrics. And yeah. the practitioner guys are not really intended to do that. Mm -hmm. They're intended to help, say, folks in OSPOs that are maybe a, maybe not developers themselves, just kind of think through what sustainability could be, and then there might be a deployed model that could support that, or metrics that could support that as well. That they would. So that that was kind of where we landed. That the audiences were different for those two. I don't know how that resonates with you. Yeah. No, that totally totally makes sense to me. Okay. Because even like like some of these are not necessarily like you wouldn't necessarily create a tool that does these three things like things like types of contributions. To be honest, most people working through the practitioner guide are probably just going to think about the types of contributions they're getting. They may or may not even actually measure it. I see. Um, yes, because it's, it's something. Such a, that, 
wide it's range. It's such a big thing and not all of it can be measured. Like, you know, this we've talked about this a whole bunch of times within, within the project, right? How do you measure the facilitation of a meeting? How do you measure some of these, you know, event organizations, some of these mm -hmm. things that, that are important. Um, so the, the practitioner guides sometimes include things that really are not very easily measurable, but that people should be thinking about. Yeah, and like down, whoops, where did the, oh, like some of these, same deal, pretty tricky to measure. Yeah, agreed. Um, okay. Yeah, so maybe we don't want to include some of these in the in the metrics models if we want to focus the metrics models on things that can come from trace data that can, mm -hmm. can be implemented in tools. And things like Gore Lab, Augur, yeah. Compass. Things like maybe new contributors. And I liked that in that conversation, I liked that distinction because it gives us two different audiences that we're kind of speaking to. Yeah. And if we point, if a tool developer is asking, you know, what are kind of like what they're doing with Compass. Like what are ways to yeah. think about preparing the metrics and then aggregating them in ways that people might find useful. Mm -hmm. Okay. That makes sense. Okay. So then if, if we took that kind of frame, um, contributor absence factor is something that can be obtained from trace data. Mm -hmm. uh, new contributors is something that can be obtained from trace data. Occasional <laughs> contributors, yeah, is something that can be. Yeah, uh, we don't have a metric, I don't think, for occasional, but we do, I guess. Um, we do. Yeah, so yes, we can get that. I is think, the, like, the, the auger provides like new contributor and second contribution data. Uh, yeah. I'm not, I don't even remember what occasional contributors is. I would imagine those are just people that return at a low volume periodically. <clears throat> People who yeah. make contributions to a project on an irregular basis. Yeah. We do have someone that hasn't submitted a pull request in at least three months and hasn't had more than 12 pull requests over the overall project. Okay. Um, yeah, and I think, Sean, you, like this one, the second contributions, I know that was a metric that you had you've been pushing really hard on and everybody really likes it. I think it kind of got stuck in discussion. <laughs> I think it got stuck in the this reorganization of the working groups because like, I think it's mostly finished and I think there's a document for it. So I'm sorry to find that. <clears throat> I think where it got stuck is every time we start talking about it, people, people start talking about how is this different from occasional contributors? Um, they get wrapped around why do we care about the second one, second contribution, um, which I, mean, I, think just, I think we should just publish it because I, I think I think it's I think it's important. I do too. Yeah. I think some people just don't like it because it's so it's so specific. I and it's similar <laughs> to first time contribution. It's similar it to occasional contributor. Um, I think we should just finish it and publish it because I, I think it's. There's nothing, nothing wrong with that. Uh, you see, see we been... keep like changing the name of it. <clears throat> it's gone from regular yeah. to second to regular. <laughs> but I yeah. think the point is second contribution. That has always been the point that they. Yeah, Elizabeth described this really well. And we've, we've just waffled over and over on this metric. Yeah. Yep. Okay, well, maybe we can bring this up in the metric meeting <laughs> and just say, all right, done. <laughs> all right. No more waffling. Yeah, all right. Let's finish that. Gary, I don't think these are metrics at this point, right? I think you would put those in there. Um, I think we have uh, growth of active contributors as a filter on the contributors metric. Okay. So this is something where I don't think we need to define a new metric, but by applying filters or we say contributors, if you count them and you combine it with their activity, then you get this. Okay. But you can see changes in these over time. Okay. Yeah. I do That's like contributors leaving the project as, um, I, yeah, I don't know that we have a metric around that, but 
we've often developed metrics because we didn't have the metric when we wanted it for the metrics mm -hmm. model. That's how okay. release frequency got mm -hmm. developed was because I wanted it for my metrics model. And so I had to write the metric to publish the model. Okay. And I think actually some of Gary's aren't published either. I think he's got some metrics in those models that we haven't yeah. defined yet. TBD on some of them. I think I could be wrong. Okay, I can go take a look, but I think you might be right actually. But okay, this is great. No, and I'm pretty sure we don't have anything about people leaving our project at all. Okay. okay. I'm also fine with having higher level metrics or metrics that already take a base metric or atomic metric as we called it yeah. a long time ago. And then say, once you apply these filters or this perspective on the same data, you get a new metric. It gives you insight into something. It, it, Okay, that's fair. Um, okay, so then this is a real positive conversation. So, um, Don, I don't know if you had taken a chance to look at those and if you felt like those at least aligned a bit with the practitioner guide. I, I haven't had time to look at it. Okay. I will it was mostly just. I'll have that to do list though, and I will look okay. at it next week. Just if we were gonna carry the same name forward, the, like, the why it matters and user story should probably be pretty similar, at least in line with each other. Yeah. Um, and honestly, at this point, right? I mean, do we have references in metrics models? If we don't. <clears throat> Could still maybe add it anyway, but just like the practitioner guide is a nice reference for this. Um, okay. And then could you take a just a real quick read on the user stories as to, you know, we always kind of follow this model as a newcomer, as a maintainer. Give these just a quick read in a few minutes here. What do you think? I think they still need a little bit of work and I think we need to um, be consistent about the contributor retention and sustainability being different. Yep, yeah, I read that a few times, like down yeah. here at the bottom couple. Okay, well, why don't, um, it seems like there's interest in bringing this forward as a model. Um, so why don't maybe an action item for myself is next time we meet, I'll have this a little bit formatted a little bit better and try to go through the text on the why it matters and the user stories. Um, and we can then again, spend a little bit more time just trying to wrap this up and maybe get it published. Cause I'd like to continue that process on our models and our metrics. Yeah, that sounds good. And I'll try to take some time to have a look through it myself. Yeah, just to make sure it's not like completely out of band with the practitioner guide. That's all. Um, okay. I think it's pretty good. I just think it needs some tweaks. Okay. Okay. That's it. All right. Thank you very much. We got through a model and made a decision on how to kind of engage with SBOM folks. <laughs> we have the last two minutes. I would like to circle back on a risk model that we were developing in, for a customer and showcased at the Secure Open Source Community Day last week. Of course. The, okay. I'll share my screen real quick. That's the stuff that uh, Miguel Angel is working on, right? 
Yeah, I think he already shared this here in the call. He shared it with the data science working group. Oh, okay, perfect. So I know we only have two minutes and I won't walk through the entire uh, presentation. The idea is that we don't know all the vulnerabilities and just like sci uh, research has found code smells to be an indicator that there might be more risk in source code, we could use the idea that having community smells or looking at maintenance issues indicates risk. So the idea is to use, and we use seven metrics to calculate a score for each package and then aggregate it uh, based on which dependencies are used in a component. And the seven metrics are the backlog management index, growth of active contributors, median lead time for issues, median lead time for pull requests, the, we still call it pony factor, the contributor absence factor, the review efficient, review uh, efficiency index, I think, and then the retention rate, uh, which is similar to the retention rate and the growth of active contributors <clears throat> are what we just talked about in the other um, metric model. So is this something that you see as a metric model that we could use in the chaos community as well? Whoops, Matt, you're on mute. Yeah, sure. I have no problem with that, Georg. I mean, if, if we want to bring this forward, um, what is the story that you're trying to tell here? The story is the that there are several different uh, risk factors. One is from the way the community grows or shrinks, so retention, what we just talked about, mm -hmm. is how issues and pull requests are managed. So how long are they staying open? And then the third one is inflow of new issues and pull requests. Do we have enough focus and um, I'll be processing them quick enough. So that's the BMI and the REI. So this is, it could be either me sitting within a community asking myself, is my community at risk? Or it could be say a, a consumer of the products that this community produces asking whether or not that community is at risk. Exactly. And we built this for the consumer because they're the ones paying the yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, let me, I'll put this on the agenda for next time. And I think we might want to, as Don had pointed out, Gary had done some of those viability metric models and just yeah. kind of see how it fits alongside those as well. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Right on. I think the other, um, the other part to this is taking the individual values and then converting them by using thresholds into low, medium, high, so that you can aggregate that, basically normalizing across the very different scales of metrics. And this is something that each user would have to parametrize themselves. Mm -hmm. um, it's a new way. I don't think we have any risk model or any metric model that has tried to not just list these sort of metrics, but actually how do you combine them into a single score? Yeah, and we have room in the model template to talk through how that would occur. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I think in some cases, OSS Compass has implemented them that way, but I, I don't know if we've defined the models that way. So that would be a really interesting discussion. All right, cool. I will put you on the agenda for next time, Gator. All right, thank you. Thanks, everybody. I'll see some of you in eight minutes. Yeah. <laughs> Bye, everybody. Bye, okay. Bye everyone. Bye.